All right. So welcome, everybody. I know that this is a big week for a lot of people, um, especially when it comes to the holidays. Passover is starting this evening, and we have um, Good Friday and um, Easter Sunday this week. And so this is an interesting time to be talking about um, the topic of reconciliation, I think, because when I think about... um, People praying the world over, no matter what their spirituality is, oftentimes we are reconciling with each other um, and we're reconciling maybe our own uh, difficulties, if you want to call them transgressions, sins, and um, reconciling, I think, with ourselves and who we are. And that's one of the um, points, I think, of the topic of reconciliation. So... Here's a statement by Thich Nhat Hanh that I particularly like. Oops, I just lost myself. Can oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm still very impaired when it comes to this technology. The technology here. So the um, the quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, is that the practice of peace and reconciliation is one of the most vital and artistic of human actions. And I think that's an incredibly big statement because when we think about vitality states, or when I think of vitality states, I think of a sense of aliveness and joy. And um, the vitality states are the opposite of depression. So when you feel excited or when you have anticipation, especially for seeing somebody that you love or something that has meaning to you, let's say if one of these spiritual or religious holidays have meaning to you, that is a sense of vitality that we actually feel in the body. Um, It's exciting. It's um, inspiring. It also engenders curiosity. So to be able to practice... um, reconciliation in a, it requires a vitality. You can't do it when you're depressed or when you're angry or when you're holding a grudge, for example. And he goes on further to state that the practice of reconciliation is an artistic human action. So I wonder what um, he or you are thinking about when you think about this as an artistic endeavor. Uh, when I think of artistry in the human condition, I think of creativity. And creativity is a high vitality state. Creativity requires, again, that we're not depressed, we're not anxious, and that we're not thinking too much either. Uh, when our left brain gets involved in matters, we start to overthink things. Um, the left brain actually has a tendency towards confabulation, meaning it makes stuff up. So even though you know something to be true, it will talk you out of what's true, especially if you know that thing to be true in a a gut instinctual kind of way. So think about the practice of peace and reconciliation as being similar practices that one has to have a sense of internal peace in order to be able to reconcile something that wasn't right in their life or reconcile with a person who possibly you've had difficulty with. So if that reconciliation requires vitality, it's an artistic expression, um, and it's something that's distinctly human. Animals don't reconcile with one another in the ways that human beings do. I mean, certainly animals have play states and they fight and Sometimes when they fight, they do make up, but their making up is typically a physical expression of it. So um, usually if you see a cat and dog fight, and if they live in the same household, they may eventually have some sort of reconciliation with each other. Usually they go away in a huff, and then they come back at a later date, and you might find them grooming each other, and that is their reconciliation. So does anybody have any thoughts or um, comments about this? Uh, particular idea. You can, you know, type me a chat, or you can speak if you want to. All right. Well, moving on then. So, making up and reconciling with people is incredibly difficult, and. I want to say that we shouldn't always reconcile with people that we've had trouble with. 
literally. Oftentimes we can do so in our own heart and our, in our own minds. And I think that's what the practice of mindfulness requires, is that we do these things for ourselves so that our own conscience is clear. But sometimes we may want to reconcile with somebody who can't really hear it, or the reconciliation is not going to go anywhere, or you know that it's actually going to create more problems with that person. So better for you not to confront them directly, but to reconcile within your own self. That said, you also want to make sure you're not using that as a cop-out to not reconcile with somebody directly. So cleaning up the past is important, I think, so that we can go forward in unencumbered ways in all of our relationships. Otherwise, we can hold on to a story that um, is one of being a victim or that we always get hurt when we engage with this kind of person or that kind of person. So important to make sure that you are really clear with your own self. Reconciliation requires us to reach past judging the other person, um, and that can be difficult if you feel like you've been wronged or if somebody actually did something that was really wrong, somebody physically hurt you or they emotionally hurt you or they used you or you felt like you were taken advantage of. This is a time to start to look at what your part is in the problem in the first place. And this is a tenant of the 12-step program to begin with. It's what the fourth step is about in part, which is really looking at our grievances, um, our um, place of being victimized, our resentments and our hurts, and starting to really unpack those and look at what was my part in what happened here. Yes, that person stole money from me, or they broke up with me in a way that was really mean and cruel. But what part did I have in letting that happen to begin with? Was I too liberal with my money? Was I too trusting? Um, was I not living in reality by thinking this person was somebody other than who they showed themselves to be because I was living in a fantasy state with them? So what was my contribution to why I was hurt or wronged? And I think that's where we have to reach beyond our judgment of the other person as being a jerk or small-minded or they were users. Um, the, the more we stay in that place of being judgmental, the more we construct ourselves as victims. Well, we can start to see that we had a part in the whole situation, uh, that we were a party to it, and grow and learn from it so we don't engage ourselves with people like that again, um, the better. And when we fixate on our judgment of anyone else, we start to play God with their lives. Um, we start to decide who is okay and who isn't, and there's a self-righteousness in that where we can get on this moral high ground, and that is a good way to alienate ourselves from people also if we are always right and everybody else is always wrong. Somebody just sent a question asking, does the approach to reconciliation differ at all for relationships uh, characterized by abuse, whether it's emotional or physical? And... I would say yes. I would say if somebody was physically or emotionally abusive and maybe we had a part in that, maybe we didn't, then we have to reconcile inside of ourselves. We can have forgiveness for that person inside of ourselves with ever having to go back and sort of have it out with them or make amends to them because you don't want to do anything that's going to harm you further if you've been in an abusive relationship with somebody. If, for example, I know that going and talking to somebody who I've had difficulty with in the past is going to have them saying in this moment, well, I understand or I forgive you, but then in the next moment, hour, day, week, they end up hurting me in the same way again, uh, we start to put ourselves in a situation to be set up for um, hurt over and over again. And, of course, the most famous metaphor for that was Charles Short Schultz's um, Charlie Brown cartoon, where um, over the years, for those of you who remember, there was a cartoon where Lucy would set up the football and Charlie Brown would run to kick the football. And every time she pulled the football away from him and he ended up, you know, kicking it and landing flat on his back on the ground. And this happened over and over again for years, for decades. And he always fell for the same um, uh, spoof on her part every time. And so 
you don't want to be Charlie Brown, Lucy, in the football by apologizing or reconciling with people that are going to hurt you over and over again. Someone else asked a question about um, how does judgment of ourselves affect mindful reconciliation? And I think that if we judge ourselves as being wrong or let's say um, we have shame about a situation that we were in and we ended up doing something where we hurt the other person and they left us or we hurt the other person and the relationship ended poorly. And on some level, I always know what my part was in it, and I always know that I did something that I could have done better. But sometimes when we're in the circumstances, we can't do any better than we're doing because we don't know what we don't know. It's when we have distance from the circumstance that we can look back on it and say, oh, wow, I was really out of line there, or I was off the mark there, or I shouldn't have done what I done, uh, you know, what I did to that person. It wasn't okay. So, being mindful of my own part in it allows me to either reach out to that person and apologize or do some journaling about it so I make meaning about it so I don't do it again or so that I'm more mindful about the kind of people I get in relationship with um, so that I'm not repeating those errors again and again. So does anybody have any thoughts or questions about that statement? Um, one question here is, what's the uh, first step in reconciling within ourselves? And I think that that is um, a really good question because we each have our own processes. Um, for some people, you might ruminate about it and think about it obsessively and play the scenario out over and over and over again in your head about what was right, what was wrong, what was okay, what wasn't. And sometimes that can just lead us into an obsessive loop that doesn't go anywhere. So I think that journaling is an incredibly useful tool, and it's a way to be your own psychotherapist where you sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and I prefer pencil and paper or pen over the computer because there's a more organic setup between um, the use of our hands and our brain and aspects of creativity. So you want to sit down and write automatically without thinking about it too much. And just start right where, from where you are. You might start by closing your eyes and taking a few deep breaths and just saying to yourself, I want to ask the question of how do I reconcile with myself about what just happened between me and that other person? And let yourself start just writing. You know, I'm sitting here with this pen and paper. I don't know what to say. I feel really badly about what I did to Jane, and I don't want to do things like that again um, because I've had a history of doing it, um, et cetera, et cetera, and just see what comes out. And the conventional wisdom is to write about three pages without stopping. Don't worry about being in the lines. Don't worry about punctuation. Don't matter. Don't worry about making sense or whether you're gonna, anybody's going to go back and reread it. It's really for you to get to a deeper level of clarity and understanding with yourself so that you can ultimately forgive yourself for what you did um, by looking at what your part was in it, forgiving yourself, and then considering what parts can you apologize for and what parts can't you apologize for. And would you apologize to this person and reconcile with them in real time or by way of a letter? And let's just keep in mind that forgiveness precedes reconciliation, that we have to come to a clearing of I'm sorry, and our sorry has to be accepted by the other person um, before we can both say or exhale and say, wow, that was really hard and difficult, and I'm so happy you're in my life again. And I think that's also part of the consideration is, does this person matter to you enough in order to reconcile with them? Do you really want them in your life, or would you rather just let them go? And letting people go is okay, too. Uh, but the main thing is that psychically and energetically, you want to let them go. So somebody stated that this is also parts of um, step eight and nine in the 12 steps of actually identifying who you want to make amends to and then actually making those amends. If you're not in a 12-step program, um, it's useful to know that it's helpful to make a list of who you want to make amends to. 
who you want to reconcile with, and then actually taking the steps to do it. And um, somebody asked a question about what the first step in forgiveness is. Well, I think that's similar to reconciling with ourselves and forgiving ourselves. And that starts with self-compassion. Um, Do you practice self-compassion? Do you let yourself be fallible? Do you see where your weaknesses are, where your blind spots are? And can you accept yourself in a loving way for that? Or do you beat yourself up for it? Or do you just not look at it at all and get self-righteous and just say that other person was at fault or they were the jerk? So those are sort of the steps to it. So as we stop blaming and shaming the other person, and we start to look at what our own fallibility is, what our own weaknesses are, blind spots, um, the places we're just maybe not that evolved, and then can move into self-compassion, then we can start to forgive ourselves and consider whether we want to reconcile with the other person or not. Someone asked a question in the instance of estrangement due to a relapse. So this is a relapse specifically somebody's asking about in terms of their sex addiction. What might be done to address the position of a spouse um, is when the spouse is not or is unengaged with a therapeutic or educational process? Um, I think that's really difficult when somebody is in a program for any kind of addiction and they're struggling with that addiction and they have slips and they're in relationship with someone who doesn't have any knowledge about the nature of the disease, whether it's a behavioral problem or a substance problem, um, all they see is that they're being treated poorly or badly, they're hurt, they feel betrayed, uh, they're incredibly traumatized by the betrayal because it has them feeling like something's wrong with them or they could have done something differently. And so they they bail out of the relationship. And it's difficult because they're not getting any kind of support that they so desperately need. It makes it very difficult to um, reconcile with them in any way because they're going to be coming back to you if they do reconcile, not from a strong place in their self, from a weak place in their self. So in a way, it's almost... um, I could say egregious or not very thoughtful on the part of the addict to reconcile with someone who doesn't have any therapeutic support or any kind of support in the recovery community because they're setting themselves up to be Charlie Brown in the Lucy Charlie Brown football metaphor again. And in that case, you are actually rendering harm on them over and over and over again. So the second point on this slide is that our problem with someone else's behavior may reveal a self-doubt we have yet to resolve. And that's really good at looking at because that's where judgment comes into play. Um, If I am, you know, judgmental about what your behaviors are, let's say I'm involved with somebody who's an addict and they're relapsing and I'm not getting any help, um, the self-doubt I'm having about that person, that addict, may have to do with the fact that I've not resolved my own issues about why I keep putting myself in a situation um, that I'm in relationship with an addict um, or I get in relationship with addicts over and over again and they only hurt me repeatedly. I have to start looking at my own unresolved issues around that. And the next point is that even if it entry takes, and exit chimes are off, um, even if it does take two to tango, making up is an inside job. True reconciliation happens only when the parties involved take responsibility for changing themselves instead of each other. And this is a very tricky statement because. Both parties, yes, have to take responsibility for what happened. Let's say it was an argument between two people, and it was a bad one, so much so that somebody stormed out of the house um, and decided not to come home. And maybe it has to do with uh, betrayal or cheating, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it has to do with financial concerns or in-law concerns or something along those lines. Um, Both parties have to cool down and take a look at, again, 
what is my part for changing this dynamic in the relationship? Because when we can really get clear, we start to see that our partner is who they are, just like we are who we are, and that there's no perfect partner out there. There is no perfect match. There is no prince or princess charming out there. It's who we are and what we're bringing to the relationship and who our partner is and what they're bringing, and both parties suffer their limitations. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, am I good enough? And is my partner a good enough human being? And if we're both good enough and we're doing the best we can, then we have to take responsibility for the dynamic between each other. So it's not that you're bad and flawed and I'm bad and flawed. Something happens when the two of us come together that's really bad and flawed. So I'm doing something to exacerbate the arguing or I'm doing something to aggravate you further and you do the same thing to me. So where do we fight unfairly? Where are the low blows or the dirty shots we're throwing because we know exactly how to activate each other? What are the ways that we can be better listeners? There are studies now that show that listening actually paves the way for the speaker to understand themselves better. So when you listen well to your partner and you're not formulating your best retort or response or um, how you're going to go in a one-upsmanship position on them, you're actually making a space for them to settle down, for them to get clear, and for them to maybe start to own what their part in the situation is. And likewise, they'll do the same for you. Um, somebody's texted in a question saying, many of my clients come having beat themselves into the ground over not being able to forgive an intimate person who has hurt them. If that's an issue, I've suggested they replace forgive with accept. Uh, in other words, enter a process of reconciling themselves with the fact that the hurt happened. What's your experience of therapeutically languaging um, these precursors to responsible reconciliation. So sometimes we can't forget an intimate person who has harmed us, and we've all heard the adage that it's okay to um, forgive but not forget. So what this person is proposing is that um, maybe we can accept that the person did what they did. And I think that's really a wise way of framing this, that if somebody has hurt me, if somebody has been emotionally abusive or they've stolen money from me or they've cheated on me, I don't necessarily have to forgive that. I have to accept that it happened, though. I have to be in reality that this actually happened, that this person actually really betrayed my trust. They betrayed the relationship. I am, you know, in an acute stress state because of it. I don't know what end is up. I don't know who I can trust anymore. Um, I've lost my faith in relationships, perhaps. So forgiving at that moment is generally impossible. It's way too soon and early. But I do have to accept that it happened to me. And um, then over time... If I decide I want to forgive that person because I don't want to hold that pain and that hurt and that judgment in my own system anymore because it really is toxic. We're, we're holding energy that creates a hyperarousal in the system. For some people, that may mean releasing large amounts of cortisol, which is detrimental to the body, to the organs, to the brain. And so who needs that? Who needs that kind of... Um, you know, sickness making of ourselves, it's better to do a lot of work around letting that go. And for some, it's journaling. For others, it's prayer. For some, it's meditation. Um, for some, it's yoga or going for a run. But it takes time to not ruminate over these matters. And I would also recommend you know, noticing the ruminating and the obsessing and stopping it whenever you can because we can start to feel like we're just a hamster on a wheel you know, running the same story and patterns over and over and over again, which just gets exhausting. And it also keeps us out of our feelings. So when you dive deeply into the feelings under the pain, what you'll find there is a whole host of sensory experiences, tightness, um, exhaustion perhaps, tears, anger. These are all feeling states long before we pattern them into obsessive uh, thoughts. 
So we want to dive deeply into the feelings. And then somebody asked a question about, um, isn't that possibly a misunderstanding of forgiveness? Um, I'm not sure what is, uh, maybe we make a bigger deal of forgiveness than we have to. It's almost unreachable if we're thinking of forgiveness that way. So I'm not sure I'm understanding what being a misunderstanding um, of forgiveness. I don't think reconciliation and forgiveness are the same thing. I think we have to forgive before we can reconcile with somebody. And again, whether that's in our own hearts and mind or literally. Um, so can it, where we find, the, okay, in other words, we don't have to forget when we forgive. No, I think those are two different things. I don't think we should ever forget because when we forget, we set ourselves up to be hurt again. Um, and this is a, a notion and a saying that I believe came out of the Holocaust with Holocaust survivors that one of the statements were that we can forgive, but we can never forget what happened, which is why we have all sorts of you know, museums of tolerance. We don't forget the brutality of, you know, um, segregation and um, slavery in this country any more than we forget the Holocaust. We remember because that can happen again. So we remember that this person who was abusive can abuse us again, you know, whether they're addicts or not. Um, addicts can't often help what they're doing, but being on the receiving end of uh, living with an addict can feel abusive. So you can't go back into a relationship, even though there has been some forgiveness, thinking that this is never going to happen again. You have to believe that it could happen again. And that's the price that you pay for reengaging with somebody who has an addiction or reengaging with somebody who has hurt you, uh, whether it was emotionally, physically, or sexually in some way. Um, this certainly goes for parents also that have been abusive and hurtful. So sometimes it's healthy to separate from people who hurt us. And on the matter of parents, for example, um, those of us who were hurt by our parents, some were hurt more than others, some grew up in insensitive households. Um, some grew up in households that were just patently brutal. Deciding whether we want to engage with somebody again or not um, is important. And so it's, it's good to separate from people that have hurt us for periods of time, sometimes long periods of time. Sometimes we can never reconcile. Um, so somebody asked a question that if you believe it could happen again, isn't that not letting go? Well, if you believe it could happen again and you re-engage with the person, you have to let go to a certain extent, but you've got to be careful about not setting yourself up for disappointment. So let's say we have a friendship and you're a friend that I trusted and I liked and you did something that betrayed me. Uh, you lied to me about something, and it was really hurtful to me. And I worked through it, and I looked at maybe how I set it up for the lie, or I've kind of seen that maybe you were a little bit of a liar in the past, but I overlooked it. And this was a big lie. And I go to you and I say, I want to talk to you about this because you really matter to me, and I want us to continue having a friendship. I now know that you could possibly lie again. So I'm probably, and this is just me, I'm probably going to take a step back from that friendship. I'm not going to trust you the way that I did. I'm not going to give you too much responsibility so that you could hurt me again. But I want to stay engaged with you in, enough because I have fun with you and there are parts of you that make me laugh and I know that you're not a bad person. I knew that you just, you know, you had to grow up lying in order to survive and you still do it out of these habituated patterns. So I have to detach in some ways in order to stay in relationship with you. If I let myself get super close to you again, and it happens again, in some ways that's on me, because I knew you could do it again. So what I hope you're hearing is that there is an interweaving of responsibility that we have to take in our relationships, that we can't just completely throw caution and hand over our entire life and heart to somebody else, because that somebody else is a human being and we're all fallible. So somebody writes that sometimes I worry that not forgetting also keeps clients in fear of the hurt happening in again in a way that gets in the way of reconciliation. And that's a very tricky thing because that fear of it not happening again is sort of our natural alarm system that 
we don't want to live in a hypervigilant fear state because that's not a healthy state to live in. That's actually a traumatized state, and it's problematic because that person will never be able to trust anybody again. But we also don't want to deny our fear to the extent that we put ourselves in dangerous situations. So those are the extremes. But being able to um, work through forgiveness and not forget what happened I think is not the same as not ever forgetting. And the process of forgiveness and reconciliation takes a very long time, a very, very long time. I mean, the conventional wisdom says it can take three to five years. Who knows how long it takes? We're all so different. We all have such different regulatory capacities and different attachment issues and different ways of relating. Um, Some people will never forget, and they can only forgive 80%. And the person who was the offending party has to decide if they can live within the realm of that 80% forgiveness. Some people can, some people can't. So any questions about that? Right. Well, we can learn to open our hearts to the other person even when we no longer open the door to them. And that, I think, is um, an important piece to remember that sometimes we won't ever be in relationship with people again that have hurt us. An important piece to remember that sometimes we won't ever All attendees are muted. Um, Sorry, I was hearing an echoing on the line. Uh, Somebody says, it seems we're discussing our trust in somebody that something won't happen again, triumphing over our knowledge that it may happen. And I think that's true, but we have to be careful the degree to which we put our trust back in that person. Acknowledging that it may, but realizing that you have enough self-acceptance and faith in yourself to trust that if it does happen again, you can walk away with yourself intact. And I think, yes, you are understanding that correctly, but it's a gamble. If you've been involved with somebody who has betrayed you emotionally, physically, sexually, financially, and we get in relationship with them again, we are gambling that they could do it to us again. And if they do, is it going to hurt as badly as the first time? And that depends on how open our eyes are um, versus how much we go into denial or we want to believe in an idealized way that they won't do it again. Now, Probably those of you who have had who have children in your life, uh, especially teenagers, know that they're going to do it again and again and again because they have a teenage brain, and so we don't, um, you know, we forgive them. We typically sometimes forget about what they've done, and we know that they're just going to do it again anyway. And usually, it's not anything that that it's that horrible. It's like they keep leaving, I don't know, their homework in their jean pocket, and you wash it, um, or they, you tell them to lock the back door and they forget all the time. Um, those are people that we have to work with over and over and over again because they're our children and their brains are still forming and that's part of the teenage brain. It's the teenage condition that adults have to repeat themselves ad nauseum. But when we're talking about adult relationships here, we have to do a cost-benefit analysis, even though that sounds sort of cold, and really look at what's the benefit of being in relationship with this person and what's it going to cost me. Somebody asks, how does one know when there's not an opportunity to reconcile? Is there a book I can read that will help me evaluate this? Um, I don't know about books on reconciliation. I know there are books about, um, you know, how to forgive. There's a beautiful book called After the Affair, for example, by Janice um, Spring Abrams on what happens when there's a single incident affair and how to move towards forgiveness. Uh, I think you really have to, when you say there's not an opportunity to reconcile, I think we have to make opportunities to reconcile. We have to do our own work through the matters that um, or means I've been talking about and really get clear in ourselves about, do I want to reconcile with this person or don't I? And once I come to the belief that I really want to, 
and I'm clear about what I want to say and why I want to do it, then I think you have to pick up the phone or you have to send a letter via email or a direct letter and write something that's heartfelt, that's meaningful, that's sort of short and to the point. I would recommend that it not be this long treatise, but, you know, a letter that's no longer than a page saying, I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about how much you mean to me. I remember how many good times we had together and why this relationship has meaning to me. And I'm also have really missed you, and I've been very sad about the way things ended. And I, for one, have done a lot of thinking and soul-searching and work on this, and I'd like to get together with you and talk about my part in what happened. So you can't expect that the other person is going to meet you in kind or that they've done any thinking about what their part is in it. Most people are afraid to get together for a talk of reconciliation because they think they're going to be blamed and shamed. They think that we're going to show up and tell them all the things they did horribly and that it's just going to be a repeat of the initial argument. So in your letter, I think you have to be very clear that you're coming to this meeting because you have an amends to make to them. And that goes back to the person's statement about the eighth and ninth step in the 12-step programs, that these are your amends, they're for you, and they're because you're hoping to um, smooth over what got roughed up and move on. Somebody asked a question saying, um, aren't some addicts and abuse victims stuck in a state resembling the age when they experience trauma? And I would say, yes, that's so. When they get help, does it change the state or just restart the development? Are they still years behind in development? Well, I think that um, it's different for every person. And um, when people are abused, their state changes um, become their traits. So if they were hurt terribly and they learned to lie um, as a way of surviving, they become liars over time. And when they start to get help, um, it initially changes their state, but over time, it changes their traits and who they are. The lying becomes less because they start to see that they don't have to survive to lie anymore. Um, but yes, they're still developmentally behind. It takes years to change these patterns because we are creatures, you know, that are patterned creatures. And while there's a tremendous amount of neuroplasticity, we've all heard about that. Plasticity actually means um, it's the equivalent of Play-Doh, if you will. It means malleable. And the higher cortical functions are very malleable. These deeper structures are harder to change, though. Our autonomic nervous system, for example, our tendency to be reactive, these take longer to change. So people can change and do change when they're addicts and they're working a really good program, they're going to therapy, they're doing everything they're supposed to do, but these changes are incremental. And so we either love people for who they are and their humanity um, and we, we assist them in the change process and they assist us. So it's a mutual regulatory recovery process between two people or we move on. Somebody asked a question about um, what are your thoughts? Um, sorry, let me get the question. What are your thoughts about a break that occurs when one party has no idea why the split happens and wants to reconcile, but the other party does not? How can the person wanting reconciliation attain their peace and closure with no answer? I would say that's one of the most painful and most difficult and confusing uh, situations there can be because the person just drops off the face of the earth, right? They just... Um, drop out of your life. There's no um, statement about it. It's completely unceremonious. So it just leaves us thinking that something's wrong with us. I mean, what could possibly happen that somebody would leave without ever saying goodbye? It just seems very, very cruel and very painful. And so sometimes with our best efforts to reach out and ask what happened, that person can't tell us. And so I think for our own sanity and health and well-being, we absolutely have to assume that that person has an issue that they can't deal with, that they either have so much shame about what they've done because they've cheated or lied um, 
or something is just terribly wrong with them, that they cannot face you to tell you what went on and why they walked away in that way. They're in some kind of pain. They've got some sort of situation going on, and they just don't have the capacity. And I would say that you don't want to be with a person who doesn't have the capacity to say to you, I'm sorry, um, or I can't be with you right now because X, Y, or Z has just happened. If somebody doesn't have that basic kind of human sense of um, respect and dignity for themselves and for you, run. You don't want to be in a relationship with that person. All right, so how do we open our hearts to people we no longer want the door open to? And I think about this sometime again with an offending parent, for example. Um, There's a way to love that person for who they are but not like them. And that is a person, um, you know, these are challenging people that sometimes we have to work with our entire lives on our own psychic level. Um, I've had my own difficulty with my own parents when I was, you know, a teenager and much younger. And through my own work of reconciling in my heart what happened, who these people were, I was able to come to love them quite deeply. And neither one of them ever went to therapy or really changed much themselves, other than what time does to change people over time. Um, Usually as people get older, they soften a little bit. um, They see life a little bit differently. But I believe that when we change ourselves, we change our relationships fundamentally, and we can love those people much more than we ever could when we are in our own issues. Splitting from others rarely results in peace of mind, and which is what we've been talking about, for we're still at war with our thoughts, and that is the violence that we perpetrate on ourselves. The violence is happening between our ears, and the more we are filled with hate, the more we're filled with resentment, the more we're filled with feeling like you know we were victimized, and we just keep exhausting this story over and over and over again without taking any action to rectify it, we won't have peace. And as we recall, peace and reconciliation is what Thich Nhat Hanh was saying, um, are two of the greatest human artistic endeavors. So reaching a place of peace um, is, is incumbent upon us, and it's really essential for our own health and well-being. And our capacity to forgive those who have wronged us mirrors our ability to confront and reconcile personal trauma. And that's where we bump up against our own limitations, when we just absolutely can't forgive somebody, or we absolutely can't like somebody, or absolutely anything, really. That's where our own blind spots are and our own limitations are. And I think it's very important to get extremely curious about our own limitations. Why can't I forgive that person? And really let yourself write about that. And and, and really, and in the most um, vitriolic way, you know, talking about why you hate them and what a horrible person they are and using expletives and um, just raging at them on paper. So it helps you look at where you're stuck and where you're, why you're so judgmental or so enraged or so hurt because those levels of extreme hurt and rage are, yes, about that person, but they tap into our most primitive issues, our most primitive terror of being abandoned, our most primitive terror of being rejected, of dying even. And that's what we have to make peace with. And we can only make so much peace with it because we are primitive creatures. So those areas areas of our brain and nervous system are going to be activated mightily. But a lot of times they, they do track back to our early childhood years, our early relational trauma with our caregivers. And that's why um, Jung talked about these layers of the onion that we have to peel back when we're looking at our own psyches, that it's rare that anything is what it is on the surface for us. Although Freud did say a cigar was just a cigar. But when it comes to relationships and matters of the heart, when we're hurt in real time in a relationship, it almost always is going to have multiple layers that resonate down to our earliest, earliest hurts. Uh, Whether in our families from our parents or being bullied as a child, something will get activated and that Um, really has to do with our own personal trauma that we haven't reconciled. So does anybody have any questions or thoughts about that? So we can reach out to reconcile um, after a lover's spat. 
Uh, we make the call to repair what's broken in our relationship. And when you have that kind of spat or what I call bickering or arguing, um, when I know when in my relationship I've escalated something past the point that was really necessary just because it's, you know, I'm having a bad day or I'm aggravated. Afterwards, I'll think, you know, did I really need to put my partner through that? Did I need to put myself through that? And I will always reach out and say, you know what, I'm sorry that I did that. I'm just aggravated or I'm tired or I wish um, I wasn't working. I wish I was taking a walk with you or doing something more fun. Um, I take responsibility for it and I try to move into it first so that I can be a grown-up, I guess, be an adult about taking responsibility for my actions. So that's a really good place to practice and to start is when you have an average spat or aggravation with somebody, whether it's your mother or your best friend or your lover, make the experiment of being the first one to call and say, I'm sorry, I wish I hadn't done that, and really look at what your part is in it first. Reconciling after a long separation you want to ask yourself if it's time to reconcile and to talk it over with at least three trusted friends whose conciliatory actions you admire. And um, in the 12-step program, people talk about having fair witnesses, sponsors, other people in program, therapists. Uh, people talk about having trusted others or guides. Um, we talk about having trusted friends here so that you're living in counsel and consultation. You're not just running all of this between your ears, as it were, that you're really, really thinking about it mindfully, talking to other people. It's good to talk to people who have had these experiences also. If you have a friend who has broken up and separated and gotten back together, how did they do it? What worked? What didn't? Um, also knowing who your partner is and what they will respond to and what they won't respond to uh, is a good idea also so that you're not just taking um, anybody else's uh, advice without thinking it through. Um, so there are a few questions here also I want to get to. When you acknowledge your part, the other person isn't there yet and they say yes you were wrong and that's it. Oh, okay, yeah, that might happen sometimes, is that you go with your best intention to say, this was my part in it, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and the other person um, says, yeah, you were wrong, and that's the end of it. There's no place to go with that. They're going to take the self-righteous high ground. Uh, that's the position that they want to keep and hold, and you've got to be careful not to go into shame because you know that you're in your integrity, because you spoke your truth, you owned your part in it, your conscience is clean, and when you walk away from someone like that, that tells you who they are and that you don't want to be in relationship with someone like that because there's no meeting there, there's no ground there for reconciliation, it's a one-way street. That would be an irreconcilable impasse. Um, someone says, so this sounds like this is a situation where it's actually okay to project the problem person onto them. Um, and I would say, well, yes, I guess you could call it that and say this person has a problem, or at least they have a problem with me, or our chemistry doesn't jive. Chances are that's probably who they are and what they do in relationship, because when you're willing to take that kind of risk and make yourself vulnerable and create an opening and an opportunity to say, I was wrong, this is what I did, and I shouldn't have done it, the other person has the chance at that moment to say, wow, I never thought about that, but you know what? I was wrong too, or I wish I hadn't have said it the way I said it. You're making a space for healing to take place. And if that person is not going to take that opportunity, then I suppose you could call them the problem person. Um, and so, yes, that would be, I guess, in relation to the person who drops off the face of the earth. Someone says, I think this situation can be too complex and nuanced to make a wastebasket diagnosis here, and I would say that's true. I don't know that we are um, using a diagnosis. Certainly, problem person is not a diagnosis. Um, it is complicated, and the truth is I might get into something with somebody, and I end up not liking that person, and I don't want to reconcile with that person, and I don't think they're a very nice person, or I don't like them, and you might say, wow, this is a really cool person. I like them. We get along together. Great. They're basically a good person because, look, nobody's murdered anybody here. Nobody's uh, done something super egregious. We're talking now about friendship um, reconciliations. 
Um, yeah, to each his own. We never, we never really know. It is complicated. This person says, when an individual feels attached to an unavailable person, I found it helpful to consider that I'm unwilling to accept that the person may feel as troubled as myself. This opens the door to me to possibly having pity for them. So I would say compassion is probably better than pity because pity kind of puts us in this one upsmanship position like we're better than. But if somebody is attached to an unavailable person, um, then, yeah, they're struggling with their own unavailability is what's really true about that. And that person, if you're the unavailable person and that person is attached to you, you've got to look at that and say, yeah, what happened that I seduced them into being involved with me when I wasn't really available? Or I've hit an impasse and I've hit this impasse before. This is where my limitations are because I'm avoidant in relationship and boy, I better go look at that and I feel badly for that person that they would choose me. Um, All of that is actually compassionate, I think, more than pitiful. Um, And somebody asked a question, is that an expression of alternative states, shame versus integrity? So I don't know exactly what that question is hearkening back to, but yes, I think we want to move from shame into our integrity. And that's why when we take the leap to say, I'm sorry, even though we're making ourselves feel vulnerable, we're moving into our integrity. And if that person says, well, yeah, you were wrong, they're shaming us in that moment. But it's important to hold on to your integrity and know that you did the right thing and not tank into shame. That will help you change enormously in that moment. You'll walk away with your dignity intact. You'll walk away knowing that that person has their limitation and you can't be in relationship with them. And while you might feel a tinge of shame, know that you did the right thing. So the last point here is reconciling interpersonal conflict. Um, You want to list the positive traits of those you're estranged from, whether it's an ex-lover, former friends, difficult relatives, those with difficult beliefs, and um, reconcile with them. And I think that's what we've been talking about, too. Um, um, So... This is a helpful thing to do is is to make the list of positive traits that you uh, that you have in that person or that the things that you liked about them and why you were in relationship with them to begin with um, that will help you I think in the reconciliation um, and it will also help you have some self compassion so that you don't ask those questions or when you're asking those questions of yourself of, you know, why did I get involved with this person? Was I, was I an idiot? What was I thinking? Why would I want to be in relationship with someone like that? When you list their positive traits and attributes, you can go back and say, oh, okay, that's what I saw in that person. Were these things genuine or were they, um, was that person really seductive and did I fall for it? Because it helps you sharpen your radar and your instincts and intuition about, um, you know, the kind of people you want to be in relationship with. So does anybody have any question about any of these topics we've been talking about? All right. Well, I want to remind you that you can always call our intake counselors um, at CHS. Um, They're waiting to talk to you at any time. And even if you have questions or you need resources in your area, um, the phone number is 310-843-9902. And I just texted you that number just in case. Um, And as always... um, I think I have a call here. Um, So as always, um, we will email you and let you know when this next webinar happens. Usually it happens the first Monday of every month, but I was out of town this uh, month, almost said this year. So I hope you've enjoyed today's talk on reconciliation, uh, that you take some time and really think about who you want to make amends to, make a list of who they are, make a list of what has meaning to you, and maybe you'll make amends, amends and maybe you won't. But the important thing is that you clear your heart, mind, soul, and body. All right. Thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you and hearing from you next month. Bye-bye.